high demand for specific ethnicities, Asian, East Indian, Jewish, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern. I just very much had the altruistic piece of me triggered. And she's going to look at that and say, that's a lot of money. Women ages 21 to 29, they're not thinking about their fertility or risk. Eggs are being bought with all of the risks that follow from that. If you're tall, attractive, physically fit, and have a desire to help. And what person doesn't want to see themselves that way? To see your daughter, who's not pregnant, and stomach look like she's six months pregnant, it was awful. And I'm mad at the fact that people are out there wanting to take advantage of someone who is young or healthy and, and wanting to help. And it says right here, make a difference today, donate your eggs. It makes it sound like it's this, you know, act of benevolence. To think that this is someone who cannot have children otherwise. And this person has chosen me for the kind of person that I am. This is my duty. This is what I signed on for. This is my duty. This is what I signed on for. This is what I signed on for. Young women around the world are solicited by a largely unregulated global multi-billion dollar industry to help people have babies. What is this industry after? Their fertility, their good genes, their eggs. Human eggs are a valuable commodity, and now scientific researchers compete with fertility doctors for those eggs. These young women are subjected to risky procedures with potentially serious health complications. Who is this young woman so desperately needed by these two markets? Is she adequately informed of the risks to her health? What laws are in place for when she is harmed, and who will rise and speak for her reproductive health? her body, her life. And there was a girl that I worked with that was trying to have a baby. So she went through all the hormone shots, she went through the whole process. Um, unfortunately, was not successful, but I just saw how much she wanted to have a baby. I, of course, would see ads for it online. Hey, you know, I can help somebody and then also get paid for it too. It was a blur. I started getting more uncomfortable each day um, and a little bit more bloated. I remember just being miserable. I think I ended up gaining about 10 pounds in about that week. Um, the first person I contacted was the agency. So she was the first person I reached out to to say, look, I'm, I'm not feeling very well. I'm, I'm I'm comfortable, I'm bloated, I'm cramping really bad, it's getting worse. She reassured me I was okay. She said it's very normal, this is typical, um, nothing to worry about. Um, you know, when I had my appointment with the doctors, and the, or the doctor and the nurses, uh, same thing. They said it's normal, it's normal, it's normal. Um, after the procedure, you'll be good. Um, and yeah, and he kept saying just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. It's kind of a bad dream now. I asked him and he had told me between about 20 to 23 after researching on the whole uh, medical side of what ended up happening, he ended up taking 45. Well, after the procedure, I started throwing up instantly. Um, bad, 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 and was just unbelievably sick. Um, the worst, the only way to describe it would be the worst flu you can ever imagine. Just that nauseous and that sick. Um, I was throwing up on the jetway, I was throwing up on the airplane, I was throwing up in between flights. Again, I just kept hearing it in my head that it was normal, it was normal, it was normal. On July 25th, 1978, the world awoke to the announcement of the birth of Louise Brown, the first test tube baby. For decades, fertility specialists have been trying to fertilize the human egg with human sperm outside of the body. In vitro, which literally means in glass, in the petri dish, and then transfer the embryo back into a woman's womb in order to assist in reproduction. On this historic date, Dr. Patrick Steptoe and Dr. Robert Edwards accomplished just that, and Louise was born, a healthy baby. Just five short years later, Dr. Alan Trounson was the first to use a donated egg in creating an embryo. The IVF industry was born, and it seemed that the solution to infertility was found in the laboratory. 
The most recent data we have is from 2010, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It shows that in the United States alone, over 100,000 assisted reproductive technology cycles were performed using non-donor eggs. Less than 20% of those cycles resulted in live births. Over 80,000 cycles failed. Almost 17,000 cycles were performed using donor eggs, and while that increases the chance of a live birth, it comes at the cost of risking the health and fertility of the donor. Last year, this procedure was performed approximately 1.5 million times globally. Reproductive technology has gone mainstream and is depicted in film and television, sometimes making light of the situation. But for all the feel-good marketing and popular representation of fertility treatment, there is an alarming absence of published, peer-reviewed medical research and data on egg donation and the women who donate. And with more stories surfacing, we have only seen the tip of the iceberg. Is egg donation really as safe as the industry and scientific researchers would like us to think? What safety should be in place to protect egg donors? Are we fulfilling one woman's dream at the expense of another's health or life? Are we willing to advance scientific research at the risk of compromising a young woman's health? As it is, she is just a nameless, faceless woman, sometimes motivated by altruism, often in need of cash, but too often used and left forgotten. The issue of human egg donation is a center of conflict and disagreement, often between doctors and researchers, the fertility industry, and the scientific community, and advocates for women's health and those who want ethical reproductive practices. Supporters of egg donation maintain the practice is safe and has minimal risk. Those who are concerned for the health and well-being of otherwise healthy egg donors caution that we have never adequately studied the risk of egg donation since egg donors aren't tracked and monitored for the long term. The girls who donate eggs, after they're done with her, there's no numbers. I mean, there's nobody saying how many of those girls go on to have complications or problems. I mean, she is like nameless. She doesn't appear anywhere. She doesn't appear in the medical literature. She doesn't appear in any kind of tracking or government oversight. She is gone. One of the most striking facts is just how little is known for sure about the long-term health outcomes for women who undergo these procedures. Others note our obligation to those who charitably participate in the practice of egg donation. We have an obligation to ask questions about what it is we're doing. For someone who's healthy, who's participating, participating in research, it's, um, uh, it's an eleemosynary activity. It's a charitable activity. It's altruistic. Uh, and you can't abuse that charity, that altruism, by placing that person at risk. But how are these young egg donors recruited, screened, and selected? Is it possible to inform them of the risks? And does the money being offered cloud their ability to consent freely? In the United States, one seeking a human egg needs to look no further than a university campus. They, they don't tell you any of the health risks. I find it, I find it really offensive because I get these on my Facebook all the time. When, when you start putting a dollar value on people because of their education level, it's, 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 not, it's not right. They're offering us, you know, 20000 50000 whatever the dollar amount is, and it's just, it's really sad because they know we're desperate for money. Uh-uh, look at this, it's an elite donor, so that means, obviously, you have to go through a process. They don't want just any egg. Um, I think it's a lot of money. That's scary. Well, hopefully I will never need money so bad that I will do it. <laughs> First of all, to sell organ, I think that's stupid. You should donate if you want to help someone. And the other thing is, like, you have to be attractive woman of all ethnicity between the age of 21 and 29. So that's also a pretty screwed up, I think. I know that there are significant health risks. They have to give hormone treatment and, and the women are forced to ovulate multiple times and it's, it's pretty brutal. I'm not saying that I'm not attractive, but I'm, uh, I'm too old for that. <laughs> they won't take mine. Each woman's story of egg donation is unique but it almost always starts with an ad appealing to their sense of altruism in order to help others have babies or to advance scientific research. I first saw the ad um, for egg donors in the university paper. As a grad student, you don't earn very much money, and I was 
behind on rent, even though I was living a very Spartan sort of lifestyle. I had been looking on Craigslist due to, you know, the need and desire for money. $5,000 was easy to make. The first time that I'd heard about egg donation was when I was a college student in New York. Once I moved to Atlanta, I was just starting my job, so my money was not to me as it should have been. They're like, yeah, you know, you have the great you know, SAT scores, you got the looks, you know, you're a perfect fit, a perfect candidate for what we need. I would look for someone with a very good education. They did an IQ test on me. They, well, they definitely want to see my photos. I mean, they made it seem like it was, you know, destiny that this couple found me. I needed about $3,000. And if I had that $3,000, everything would be fine. And I thought at the time that it had solved all of my financial problems. At the end of my college career, I actually responded to an ad in the Stanford newspaper advertising $50,000 for an egg donor with certain criteria. Both Kylie and Calla suffered a stroke. Alexandra lost an ovary. Cindy almost bled to death. And Linda and LaToya were both hospitalized with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Jessica responded to an ad and went on to sell her eggs three times. At 29 years old, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. And by 34, she was dead. Her mother advocates for follow-up and long-term studies on the safety of egg donation. She wonders, given no medical history or risk factors for this disease, why her daughter died after multiple egg donation cycles. She already accomplished so much in her 29 years, and she could have, if she had had three times as long, I, I can only imagine what she would have done. We have her opera, we have classical music she's composed, and she's gone. Today, the fertility industry in America is a multi-billion dollar a year enterprise operating with little regulation or oversight. And yet the risks associated with the powerful drugs women have to take to cause superovulation are real. The egg donor is unique in that she is not infertile. She is not sick, yet she assumes all the risk in order to help someone else. At the time when I was considering egg donation, I was at a major research university, so I had access to online databases of research literature. And what I found was that there was nothing stating that there were risks to egg donors. Looking up studies and trying to see if there was anything I should be wary of, what side effects a procedure might have. And after doing that research and not coming up with much in terms of risks or dangers, then I decided it was safe to proceed. I repeatedly asked the questions, especially about hyperstimulation, and the woman that I was speaking with, she assured me that, you know, nothing would happen. I almost thought of it like a, uh, a side effect com or a commercial for a medicine that you have the side effects at the end that, you know, never really happens, but they just have to say it just in case. So that's kind of how uh, they made me feel about it, um, and that's how I kind of took it was there's n no real risks. There's no, um, nothing major that I needed to worry about, so. The procedures involved in egg donation remain unknown to the general public. Women normally ovulate one or two eggs a month, but egg donors are expected to produce many more, sometimes dozens, by a process called superovulation. LaToya had 33 eggs removed for research in an egg freezing study. They removed 45 eggs from Kylie, 60 from Cindy, 28 from Alexandra, and a total of 39 eggs from Linda in her three donation cycles. They have a requirement, at least my agency did, that you have to produce at least a certain number of eggs or else it will count as a failed cycle. Stay the course, everything was fine. We don't want this cycle to fail, you should keep doing this. Even though I question their, their protocol and everything. There are three stages prior to removing the eggs. At each stage, the woman takes drugs to artificially coordinate the procedure. First, synthetic hormones are self-injected by the woman to induce menopause. 
stopping the ovarian function while allowing the physician to control the timing of the maturation and release of eggs. The first drug they sent me is called Lupron, and its job basically is just to stop the donor's menstrual cycle to be able to be synced with a surrogate so that that person can carry the child. And the woman on the other line reportedly, because I couldn't hold the telephone at this point, said, it's all part of taking the Lupron. It's very common. Make sure she keeps taking the medicine. What was not known was that I had a small benign tumor on the pituitary gland. So when I started taking that drug, I became very ill because basically that tumor had a catalyst and caused a major stroke. So I was paralyzed on my left side and brain damage and being legally dead, I think, twice or three times. The next thing you know, I was crabby, cranky, fat, super bloated, super moody, super extreme mood swings. Lupron is not indicated for fertility use. It's a drug that's being used unapproved. FDA never approved it for use in fertility. Second, the woman is super ovulated to bring about the maturation of multiple egg follicles. The contract said that you are obligated to follow the exact dosing and protocol that the doctor tells you to do. Everything that happened to me was a chain of events where risks were not taken into account and they didn't look at the data objectively, they just kept pushing me on. They had saw that my, uh, the follicles that they're monitoring uh, were overstimulated. Um, they didn't tell me that, so I found that out after the fact. I could feel my ovaries enlarging. Um, like if I were to bend down, I could feel them flopping to one side, whatever side, you know, I was leaning. Then third, the woman takes a final injection to release the mature eggs, which are extracted during a minor surgical procedure. When I questioned if I should be taking less of the medication, to stimulate my ovaries, I was told that you have to continue the medication we give you at the dose that we give you. So I was expressing some concern at that time regarding whether or not I should, you know, continue or if they should reduce the amount of medication that they give me. The answer, the ultimate answer was no, we can't jeopardize. We can't stop at this stage. We can't jeopardize the cycle. So just continue doing what you're doing. We'll just keep watching. And, uh, I remember just being miserable and texting the agency, the, the woman I was uh, in contact with, and just telling her how uncomfortable I felt. It is clear from these women's stories that even when they expressed concerns and attempted to advocate for their own needs, those who wanted and were waiting for their eggs ignored the evidence in order to have a successful egg harvest. The fourth and final step in the egg donation process is a minor surgical procedure. Under anesthesia, using a long catheter with a needle at the end, inserted vaginally, the physician removes the eggs by suction. Harvesting the eggs, as with any surgery, has its own set of risks and complications. At first I was feeling okay, but then very soon after I began to get very dizzy and short of breath. And I was told this was probably just a sedative or anesthesia. Everything was okay, you should go home soon. And when I tried to go home, I couldn't even, I found I couldn't even stand up. I, they measured my blood pressure, it was droppings. The pain was very, it was very irritating, almost like there was blood in my belly, irritating um, my diaphragm. And I knew this from my medical studies, so I thought, you know, maybe I'm bleeding internally, maybe something went wrong with the procedure. They did get an ultrasound, and they, it was an informal ultrasound. They said, we, didn't, we don't see anything. You're fine. You're going to be fine. I saw the doctor at the reproductive clinic a few days afterwards, and he said I was doing fine. And then things went south. It was nine days after my retrieval that I woke up in searing pain. Got to the airport and was just unbelievably sick. Throwing up on the airplane. I was throwing up in between flights. I remember having to lay down on the airport carpet and now it's gross even thinking about it, but I was just that sick that I did not care. I couldn't even move. After waiting about five to six hours, things only got worse. And finally, they admitted me to the hospital. As soon as I got into the hospital bed, I felt very, very sick. They took an immediate blood pressure on me and it was about 40 over 20. They took me to the operating room for emergency explor uh, exploratory laparotomy. Uh, they basically found that a very small artery in my right ovary had been punctured. 
And most likely this was done by the needle that was used to retrieve the egg. And possibly this could have been caused by some sort of hyperstimulation as well, which makes the vessels very fragile. I felt like my insides were being tied with a string. It was excruciating. I went through a lot of things after that, but that pain is the worst pain I have ever felt in my life. I got up and went into the bathroom, and before I even made it to the door jam, I collapsed, I fainted because of the pain. I lost consciousness, and when I came to, I was able to crawl to a telephone where I called a, a friend of mine. She was one of just a couple people who knew that I had been through the egg donation. And she drove me the 45 minutes to the clinic to have them check me. It was the weekend, and the doctor who had been seeing me wasn't there. His partner was on call, and it was she who examined me. She said that my ovarian follicles were shedding. She said, oh, it's uncomfortable, but it's nothing serious. You can just go home. Don't worry about it. You can take these painkillers if it's a problem. I woke up the next morning and still couldn't move. I was just that weak, that sick. I called my manager and said, I'm really sick. I'm, I'll be there as soon as I can. And the girl that was filling in for me uh, before I got there, she looked at me and she just said, Kylie, you're gray. Don't be, like, you need to go home. The Canadian doctor told me before I left Canada that he was taking a trip to Florida and he said if I needed anything, I could get in touch with him directly. Um, so he did tell me that before I left. And so then I didn't know what else to do and I told uh, my boyfriend to call and say, ask him what to do. And the doctor told him, it's normal, just give her Gatorade, she'll be okay. They also found about 1.5 liters of blood in my abdomen, which was causing all the pain and the shortness of breath and I had to receive emergency blood transfusions. So basically I was in shock. I stayed in the hospital for another five days or so. She said that if it were anything serious, I would know, and that the worst case scenario was a torsioned ovary. And that if my ovary were torsioned, I would not have been able to walk into the clinic. So I took her word for it and I went home and I spent the next seven days in and out of consciousness. My boyfriend told the doctor, she can't keep water down. Like she's, you know, and the doctor just kept saying, no, it's okay, it's okay, she's okay. Um, it'll pass. Uh, the doctor's response initially was, you must have a, uh, like a bleeding disorder because this has never happened to me and I've done it over 3,000 times. And that's exactly what she said. And that was checked out and it was negative. But I felt like they weren't really taking this seriously. Another comment she, uh, the doctor made was, it's time for you to go home. You've been in the hospital already for this amount of time. Why are you still here? So I think the whole time I felt like they were trying to get rid of me. It was almost exactly two weeks after the donation when my graduate advisor grew so concerned about me that I had not been back to work that he came to my house and sat with me all night long and held the bucket while I vomited stool. I vomited stool for an entire night. And it was during that night that uh, I called the doctors at the clinic and they agreed that I should come back in first thing the next morning. And that was the first time that I saw the doctor who had performed the retrieval. And when he saw my distended abdomen, his face went white. And he looked me in the eye and he said, oh, Alexandra, I know what this is and we're going to be able to fix it. Your ovary has become torsioned in the fallopian tube and we will try to save your ovary. In the end, they had to remove my ovary. It had swollen up the size of a grapefruit. It was covered with puncture wounds and it had bled all over inside my body cavity. I had had so much internal bleeding that I had mild peritonitis. Mm -hmm. If I had not been treated, I would have died. He just asked what was wrong, and I just said, I, I can't feel my arm. Um, I can't grab, can't grab anything. Um, just something's wrong. I guess my, my speech was slurring, um, and he just said, what's going on? I said, I just, you have to call somebody. I said, call the hospital, call a doctor, call somebody. 
And so he called um, 911, and then they were there within about five minutes, I think, and um, just asking very general questions. Um, I didn't think... I just thought I was dehydrated. I, I really, at that point, was still in shock about the whole situation, and so I didn't... Again, in my mind, I was okay. I was I was normal. Um, I was healthy. I was... This stuff doesn't happen to me. All my symptoms were a stroke, and they knew that, and so then that's what they were testing for. Um, they were asking me when the my loss of feeling started because they had to track it by hours because there was a certain medicine they could give me. The next day, my abdomen swelled, ballooned up. I was I looked like I was probably about six or seven months pregnant. After they took out the torsioned ovary, my intestines still did not right themselves. It turned out that I had an intestinal ileus. And so I laid there on my back in a hospital bed for six or seven days. And I lost about 25 pounds. Cindy had many post-operative complications related to her emergency surgery. It took months for Alexandra to regain her strength. Kylie still faces the residual effects of her stroke. These women are still dealing with health issues that they feel are a direct result of having made the decision to sell their eggs. Short-term risks of egg donation include those associated with surgery and anesthesia, as well as risks associated with taking the daily hormones and injections to cause superovulation. The most serious short-term risk is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It's a syndrome, OHSS, that's the result of the ovary being kind of put into hyperdrive. It's producing a lot of eggs. And when you do that to a person's body, it also produces other changes in the body, which can actually, in some people, can uh, ha have the uh, risk of death. I was doing the um, ultrasounds and things like that, and then they realized that the stroke was caused by the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, and so they had to immediately stop the blood thinners. And so at that point, uh, my stroke symptoms were not their concern anymore. It was checking on my ovaries, checking on um, my blood levels, uh, everything like that. So it completely switched momentum from a stroke to this. I noticed a big difference in my abdomen. And basically they just instructed us to eat protein. I believe it took three visits for them to admit me. And that's when I came down. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Latoya, she looked as if she were six months pregnant. I couldn't believe it. Well, the nurses basically handed the doctor a needle, and it was about this long. And I said, well, what are you going to do? She said, I have to stick this in so that I could put in a, a port to drain the fluid. And that's where the pain came in. It sounded like a balloon popping. And so the, war, the fluid was kind of just coming out, and it was a panic. Because at that point, they had drained one bag of fluid, and right then, within a 15 minute time span, so they had to change the bag again. So fluid is still draining, it's still draining. And at that point, um, I guess they got everything stabilized and that's when they wheeled me up to the room that I would be in for two and a half days. The list of dangers for egg retrieval in women would include the OHSS, which would put a woman at risk for pulmonary complications, fluid imbalances, a stroke, death. Then you also have the clotting issues, that you can have clotting where you can have stroke, you can have uh, pulmonary infarcts, you can have loss of legs, you can have uh, perforation of the bowel, you can have perforation of the bladder, you can have bleeding from hitting a major organ, you can have all the complications of a surgical procedure because you have a laparoscopic procedure. You can also have in the future, you can have adhesions. So you can have problems getting pregnant or, or difficulties in the future. So there's, there's a lot of issues and safety issues that can occur from the drugs 
and then from the procedures themselves to get to collect the eggs. And when you look at the websites, when they are asking for donors, you know, volunteers, or to get paid, that information's not there. And I think that in terms of the women who are considering voluntarily or even for money donating their eggs, they need to be aware that this is not a procedure that is not without risk. And one of those risks, unfortunately, is death. So at some point while I was in the hospital, and they've never really been able to pinpoint when this happened, I had a fairly major stroke and was paralyzed on my left side for about four and a half weeks. Um, and they went in and did an emergency surgery. And talking to the woman who set up the whole egg brokerage deal, and she said, it sounds like we have to send you a drop cycle check, which means you didn't quite manage to produce what you were asked to produce, so we're going to send you $750 and we're just going to call it good. I was no longer a good option as an egg donor because I didn't have a clean bill of health. The third time, my stomach bloated up so bad that I couldn't even breathe. At that point, I had to go to the hospital. I was in the hospital for four days for ovarian hyperstimulation sy syndrome. The man that was doing my x-ray was like, are you sure you're not wearing anything under? And I said, yes, I'm sure he goes, well, I see nothing but water in your lungs. The ovaries get so big that the water doesn't know where to go, so it's pushing the fluid up into your lungs. I was shocked to learn that no one had ever studied the potential long-term risks of egg donation, especially the risks of high-dose hormones given to healthy young women. I found what felt like an olive under my skin, near my armpit. They told me I was much too young to get breast cancer, but that they would send me for a sonogram just in case. My mother never had breast cancer. My grandmother never had breast cancer. None of my aunts had breast cancer. And then I had a biopsy in September of 2007, and I received a call from the doctor, and she said, I'm sorry, but I have bad news. It's cancer. They had four months of chemotherapy. I also had 28 days of radiation. The cancer had spread to my lymph nodes. Uh, in the process of follow-up treatment after my breast cancer, they found cancer in my right breast. And the only thing that was slightly different or the least bit suspicious or irregular about my health history was the egg donation. Over the course of my medical treatment, I saw a lot of doctors, and two doctors mentioned to me that anecdotally, they do see more breast cancer among women who have had in vitro fertilization treatments. I was in a breast cancer support group with other young women who were diagnosed with breast cancer. And there was another woman in the group who had been an egg donor and then was later diagnosed with breast cancer. And then a third woman who had been through multiple rounds of IVF and was not able to conceive. Who can measure the value of one woman's story? Those defending the practice of egg donation continue to state that the risks are minimal and rare, that the procedure is safe, Every medical procedure comes with a level of risk. Ovarian stimulation and retrieval are standard medical procedures utilized for over 30 years. But in over 30 years of the practice, not one long-term peer-reviewed study has been published to back up claims that egg donation is safe for women. Without the benefit of medical research or tracking, we have lost decades of results. Just how many more stories of exploitation are out there? Until action is taken to protect young women, we will continue to hear more stories about the reckless endangerment of women. And I made a decision to sell my eggs, and that, that affected my reproductive history. My, that affected my ability to reproduce. I lost an ovary because of it. I mean, I can't have my own children now. I think there is not an adequate informed consent. I've seen some informed consents when they will say, well, there may be a risk of cancer. Well, you need to say the studies have never been done to see whether there is a risk of cancer. That's a different statement than saying, well, we just don't know. It's one thing to say they don't know the risk. It's another to know that nobody's gonna look either. And so you're really alone whether you give your eggs or not. In June of 2009, New York State became the first in the United States to offer taxpayer-funded compensation to young women who donate their eggs for scientific research. Under this hotly debated legislation, 
women could make up to $60,000 in exchange for their eggs. A 2013 bill in California sought to allow scientific researchers to pay for eggs. So why do you need more eggs? It's because we need more stem cells. In fact, I recall one study saying that as many as 100 eggs might be necessary to obtain one embryonic stem cell line, and that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The number of eggs that would be required just to treat the, say, about 20 million people in the United States alone who have diabetes, and if you just use even 10 eggs per patient, you're talking about 200 million eggs. The numbers are just staggering. That without compensation, we cannot obtain the oocytes we need to do this research that will one day improve women's health. And here a healthy woman is being asked to donate eggs. Now whether those eggs are being bought from her or whether she's being compensated for the inconvenience of making the altruistic donation depends on the magnitude of the dollars. Five, ten, fifteen thousand. It starts to look like purchase. There's a very ethical, sound way to do this, and that is to uh, compensate people for the expenses that they incurred, but don't entice them. No one's going to make an extra thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars from donating their tissue. We can cover their expenses, but that's not an enticement. We owe these women the respect to acknowledge they are capable of weighing the risks of participation and the rewards of contributing to scientific knowledge, and that they will exercise the choice that is right for them. Paying research subjects has the risk of coercion. You know, if, if you are willing to pay someone $100,000, you can get individuals to act against their own intrinsic interest, and that's the danger here. If we're going to start compensating egg donors for eggs for research, that's simply an expansion of the market. And it has the same risks and limitations that it does for reproductive use. And of course, it's heightened by the fact that uh, this will take disproportionate advantage of the poor. And that desperation dulls their capacity to defend their own interests. Economic hardship constrains choice. And here we have a, a healthy young woman, and so she is operating under a financial inducement to accept, accept risk that is against her own health interest. And that's the problem. Well, one is the financial compensation. I and mean, we're taught in medical school that anytime you have financial compensation, um, it creates in inequities in care and in the decisions that people make. So if someone is more in need of money, they're more willing to take risks. And I feel like in my case, um, the money definitely made a difference in the decisions I made. And I did make poor decisions as a result of the financial compensation. I am all for research, but not at the risk of the lives and health of more young women. Now I see the, 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 a shift where all of a sudden we have money entering in, in terms of research, and we see young women being looked at as a, a market for eggs. A woman has become a walking ovary as, you know, ovary factory, egg factory. And I think that women should not be treated that way. Where society benefits from research, we owe compensation to those who participate and contribute. Unlike infertile women who are considered patients, egg donors are treated as vendors. When they walk out of the IVF clinic, no one keeps track of them. It's an industry that pretty much thrives on profits and reputation and has very little incentive to report um, adverse events or to protect the health of um, donors who are anonymous. Governor Jerry Brown vetoed the bill, citing the unknown health risks to young women and the fact that financial compensation only compounds the problem. He opened his veto letter to the California State Assembly by stating, not everything in life is for sale, nor should it be. Given the great potential for harm to young, fertile women, what can be done to protect them from exploitation? I think in terms of the egg donor, right now she's standing alone. She's by herself. And I want to make it so that she's not by herself, that she knows that there's risks, and that she starts networking at least so that she's not just pushed in a corner and forgotten about. We can't abandon research subjects who've experienced a complication in the course of our research. That would be unethical. We would be obliged to care for them. The first thing that I would say to a young woman who's considering egg donation is don't do it. 
I went into it wanting to help somebody and um, and my intentions were good. I would, of course, have to say, don't do it. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm only thinking, hey, I'm doing something great in this world, but I could have lost my life over it. And that's, you know, those weren't things I was thinking about at that time. I was 21. I was a kid. Well, I don't think you can undo a harm in this case or any case, but I think what we need to do is to look towards the future and prevent other young women from being exploited. I think I urge every young woman I know not to do this, not to um, take a risk with this any chance I can. I wish that they would have been truthful. I would not go through egg donation again. And I sure as hell wouldn't let anybody I care about do it. My story isn't documented in any statistics anywhere, and it's impossible to find out what proportion of women who go through egg donation become hyperstimulated. It's impossible to know how many of them lose their ovaries, how many of them become infertile, and there's no good data about how many of them get breast cancer or other reproductive cancers. Nowhere in the world has anybody done any research on the aftermath of the drugs on women who've been donating, or often it's not donating, selling eggs across any of the countries that are involved in this kind of trade. They, they become forgotten in terms of the drugs that are given, in terms of no care, no follow-up. They're a faceless person that comes in and donates their eggs and then they're gone. People who are not involved in the profit motive should be involved with watching out for the safety of these women so that they aren't exploited. It has been said that the reproductive technology practiced by the infertility industry is one of the greatest social experiments of our time. A global debate is heating up on the issue of anonymous egg and sperm donation and the rights of the child conceived with donor gametes to know her parents. The truth about the dangers of egg donation is emerging, but with so many unknown risks, both short and long-term, how can we continue to ask young women to assume such a burden? Shouldn't we do all that we can to preserve their health and well-being and safeguard them from abuses? How can we demand hormone-free organic food and water and yet pump young women full of risky hormones? As older women, can we in good conscience ask them to potentially sacrifice their future fertility for our desire to have a child? And to young women who are in need of money and willing to help another woman, are you thinking about donating your eggs? Think again.